This video essay was created on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present and support Indigenous sovereignty. I love Mad Max Fury Road. I've seen it twice in cinemas and over six times at home. I think it's one of the best action films ever made. It's two hours of thrilling spectacle, which is owed to how much the narrative is primarily distilled into incredible images and cohesive editing. That doesn't mean it's above criticism though. There are largely two opinions on this film. One is a small minority which believes this film is actually feminist propaganda because an axe is a filthy cuck. And the majority proposes that Fury Road is a feminist masterpiece. But the real question is, why is the Mad Max series itself so goddamn white? Hey man, it's... it's... Oh, this isn't what it looks, man, you know, I... Let's go back a bit. I'd actually challenge Fury Road being called a feminist film. In a 1989 piece demarginalising the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine, feminist theory, anti-racist politics, Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality. Ooh, that was a big sentence. To simplify her 30-page essay, she focuses on black women to tackle the mainstream feminism contradiction in which instead of destroying white supremacy, this movement just replaced rich white men with rich white women. Without taking into consideration race, class, gender, sexual orientation, disability and other factors, how can a real framework be established for equality among all people? This is why I have a big problem with Fury Road being called a feminist film. It's a, a white feminist film for sure, but certainly not intersectional, which I think is what feminism should be. I originally wrote this piece in 2015 and its aim was to analyse the film under various feminist lenses. It disheartened me however to see there was a disturbing lack of discussion on the settler colonial implications of the series. Mad Max is set in Australia, there is no question about it. From the second film onwards, the series uses a hodgepodge of Australian, British and American actors and actors in their world building. But with its incredible landscapes and wildlife, it is set in Australia. The first three films being shot here and Fury Road moving to Namibia after unexpected rains. Most of my audience is from the US, so I want to ask you, what do you know about Australia? Over 50,000 years ago, Indigenous Australians settled onto this land. They are the oldest living surviving culture in the world. That's fact. Yeah, wow. Fast forward to 1788 where the first group of European colonizers invaded Australia. 232 years later of genocide, torture, slavery and so many other horrors. From an estimated 1 to 1.5 million First Nations people before invasion, there was less than 100,000 by the early 1900s. While Indigenous people only represent about 3% of our total population, they are more than 27% of our prison population and 55% of our youth detention population. So obviously something fucked is going on, right? In 2017, Noel Pearson noted that this makes Indigenous Australians the most incarcerated people on the planet Earth, and that's fact-checked as well. As much as I love the Mad Max series, viewing them with a more critical eye on the settler colonial themes is kind of embarrassing. Like, I'm kind of embarrassed for George Miller and his team for all the films in certain ways. I'm going to assume you have a base level understanding of what I'm talking about, but here's a super quick run through. In Mad Max, where it's only white people who have survived the oil wars. In The Road Warrior, where a white kid uses a boomerang and there's no indigenous people at all. All men of the Mudbury and Jingli tribes still make boomerangs or kurbadi in their language. They find bulwari or wallumbo trees and take branches that are already in the shape of boomerangs. They use the boomerangs for music and fighting in tribal way. They also trade them with other Aboriginal communities for cloth, spears and traditional ceremonies. Beyond Thunderdome with didgeridoo music stings with no indigenous people again. You shouldn't be afraid of the didgeridoo. It's a sacred instrument. With its sound, the great god Baime created the stars in the dream time. The men who know how to play it are very important in our culture. With the didgeridoo, they communicate our wishes to the spirits, and they call on them to come to our aid when tragedy befalls us. The sacred instrument brings us closer to the world of our ancestors. It awakens the rainbow serpent without making it angry, and allows us to speak with the god of creation. But Fury Road differs as it has the best and only indigenous representation of the series. Crusoe Kerdal is one of the accusing dead. He is such an integral character that he only needed to appear in 29 frames of the entire film. 
end of the series. The erasure of First Nations people from a series filmed on the literal country of a people who are genocided and have such a deep respect for this land is honestly quite disgusting. These films take so much of their imagery, guiding spirituality and world building from First Nations culture and history. It's a fantasy where settlers can live out the colonial dog-eat-dog -dog whims in a harsh world destroyed by the hoarding of resources, destruction of the earth, and climate change. Mm, that doesn't quite seem like a fantasy or something that's like really far in the future. It seems like something that's happening right now. Australia has consistently been destroyed by settlers since colonisation. A few recent examples are, in May, Rio Tinto blew up a 46,000 year old Aboriginal site for the sake of mining. In October, further proof that human-made climate change has halved the Great Barrier Reef's corals since 1995. A couple of weeks ago, a 350-year-old Jaburung direction tree was cut down as part of my home state of Victoria's proposal to build a new highway. Sacred birthing trees as old as 800 are at risk of being destroyed. You've seen it, you've heard it, and you're still asking questions. There is no lack of disrespect from settlers when it comes to the lives and culture of First Nations people. And I think that we have a responsibility as settlers to make the country better and to fight against anti-indigeneity, seek for the sovereignty of First Nations people and follow what they say because they're the custodians of this land. The way that they think about the land is something that we should always aspire to, actually caring about the earth because that colonizer mindset, always hoarding for resources, always wanting more, always exploiting people systems just for the sake of profit that's not really uh, an indigenous custom this disrespect actually includes some of the creative team because storyboarder and co-writer of fear road had some choice words to say about the murder of 19 year old black woman renisha mcbride who was shot in the head because she was seeking help after a car crash knocking on windows you can view the screenshot in the link below as well, but basically he's making the common racist talking points when it comes to black people and crime in the USA and conflating a liberal media with the left. This murder was just another disgustingly racist tragedy and I'm sure you know a lot of people that on Facebook will always try and say that there's a media slant towards black people, indigenous people, people of colour. But as we all know by what the media is, it's mainly liberal. The left don't like that type of media either, you know? And look, to be fair, people can change, they can shed some of their racist talking points, but if he thinks this way about black people in America, I wonder how he thinks about indigenous people. It's not a stretch. Uh, it just makes me feel gross, but I'm, I'm glad he's not involved in the next film. Now we come to the most egregious part in terms of a theme that's in Fury Road, it has real life consequences and parallels, and that's with uh, Furiosa being stolen as a young child, with her mother it seems as well who dies very quickly. But it seems that all the war boys, all the warriors, basically everybody that works is an orphan, basically. That's the kind of assumption. And for Furiosa, her story is kind of an indigenous story. It's being taken away from her nature, loving and respectful culture, full of women and support and an appreciation of the land to a mostly male dominated, violent fueled dystopia. Indigenous kids were taken from their people and basically raised on reservations like they were in the US, trying to morph them into white people, trying to breed out the black, obviously in a horrendous way of thinking, which is just, you just can't even, you can't even give that words, how awful that is. I have this book, I bought it a couple of years ago. It's called uh, The Stolen Children and Their Stories. And it's all these personal stories of these indigenous people who were taken from their parents and the lives that they endured and had to go through. And it's a lot of very, very personal information like being abused physically, sexually, emotionally, taken away from their culture, ripped away. This is a small excerpt from the story of John. He says, this is where we learned that we weren't white. First of all, they took you in through these iron gates and took our little ports off us. Stick it in the fire with your little Bible inside. They took us around to a room and shaved our hair off. They gave you your clothes and stamped a number on you. They never called you by your name, called you by your number. That number was stamped on everything. If we answered and attended back, we were sent up the line. Now, I don't know if you can imagine 79 boys punching the hell out of you, just knucking you, even your brother, even your cousin. They had to, even if they didn't want to do it. They had to. If they didn't, they would be sent up the line. When the boys had broken ribs or broken noses, they'd have to pick you up and carry you right through to the last bloke. Now, that didn't happen once. That happened every day. <sighs> um, yeah, there are just so many powering stories, beautiful stories of survival, but 
you know, it just shouldn't have happened. It's so... If you can't understand how harmful that is and how awful that is, you might be truly lost because that's just utterly fucked up. And so many of us are lucky to have not even enjoyed, you know, 10% of that. The only time I can remember being with mum and dad is three months of my life. Two years after we were removed, mum passed on. We were in the laundry working. Reverend Mother came in to call myself and my sister aside. What she said to us, I don't think I ever forgave her. Your mother's dead, get on with your work. This is coming from a so-called Christian person. Many times as a child, I tried to take my life. It was easy. I could have thrown myself down the stairwells. The orphanage wasn't a very nice place to be in. We weren't orphans. We had family. We had mum and dad. The reason we were taken away, the color of our skin. We were placed in that orphanage and forgotten. So very recently, the cast for the Furiosa prequel was announced with Anya Taylor-Joy, Chris Hemsworth and Yahya abdul Mateen II. Yahya is a welcome sight, but as we know from Beyond Thunderdome, the addition of a black character does not make your film inherently less colonialist. Why not Baikali Gunnambar, Hamilton Morris, Deborah Mailman, Briggs, Jessica Malboy, Aaron Penderson? There are so many incredible Indigenous actors that it seems like Miller and his team are intentionally looking the other way. Obviously we don't know the full cast now, but it would just continue the disappointment if George and the team didn't take a good hard think about how they can include some standout Indigenous characters and themes. Representation is not going to solve racism, I know that, and asking white people to do it is often not helpful as it is co-opted by white liberals for profit while nullifying any real systemic change. As I've clearly explained, Indigenous genocide is an ongoing process of being fight against on the streets, in conversations, and through art. Crazy smeg who eats schlanger. Look, I'm just another settler making a YouTube video. I don't speak for Indigenous Australians. Making the Mad Max series less settler colonial propaganda isn't going to change the world, but I think we need to make concerted efforts to identify it in media as well as our own actions the parallels to ongoing colonization, and the part we can all play supporting First Nations people worldwide. Back in 2015, when I wrote the first version of the piece I ended it with, if you can't see the problem in this, you are part of the problem. Which is a very cute mic drop, but also very true trick your privilege. It's your boy Barth coming to you a couple of months after recording this video. Um, I hope you liked it. Um, appreciate you letting me know what you think and um, sharing it if you think it's good. Uh, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Benny D and Robert Phillips. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hope you'll be here for a, a while. Um, and yeah, to anybody else, if you really enjoyed this, I uh, would very much appreciate you checking out my Patreon. See ya. Bye.